Hiya, this is George from Golden Game Soccer. Today we are looking at the legendary Italian coach Arrigo Sacchi. Sacchi's AC Milan team of the late 1980s and early 90s is considered to be one of the best, if not the best, club sides of all time. He won the Italian league title in his debut season with Milan and then dominated European football by winning back-to-back -back European Cups in 1989 and 1990. For five years, he was also manager of the Italian national team and led them to the World Cup final in USA in 1994, losing to Brazil in a penalty shootout. Saki is regarded as one of the greatest managers of all time and is credited with not only changing the entire style of Italian football, but also influencing great modern managers such as Jose Mourinho, Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp. He progressed the total football philosophy that began in the 1960s and 70s and developed principles that are widely used in contemporary football. We will first look at his coaching journey, but be sure to watch to the end of the video where we will explore his coaching philosophy, style and legacy. Arrigo Sacchi was born on the 1st of April 1946 in Fusignano in the province of Ravenna in Italy. Sacchi's route into football management was different to most. He had grown up watching attacking sides such as Budapest Honved, Real Madrid, Brazil and the Netherlands. He was never a great player himself and hadn't enjoyed the lifestyle of a professional footballer. He had shown some flair as a defender but only played at an amateur level for local teams in the area. At the same time, he worked as a salesman in his father's shoe factory. Saki was realistic and understood his playing limitations and therefore redirected his passion for the game into coaching and management quite early on. He was a student of the game and at 26 years old, Saki swapped playing for his local team, Baraka Lugo, and instead began coaching them. This was an immediate challenge of which Saki said, I was 26, my goalkeeper was 39, and my centre forward was 32, I had to win them over. The challenge of coaching players often older, and almost certainly better than himself, was a psychological obstacle that he had to overcome throughout his managerial career. His abilities and track record were regularly questioned. Saki showed an immediate managerial talent and quickly moved to Bellaria before joining Cesena in 1979, a team in Italy's second division, as a youth team coach. This was a more significant role and took up a lot of his time. It was at this point that his coaching career became more serious and Saki was forced to decide whether to stay at his family's shoe factory, where he was now a company director and earning a good salary, or go into football coaching and management he chose football. This would have been a difficult decision to trade the security of the family business for a career in a high risk industry with no job security and a high potential for failure. For him to choose football showed bravery in his beliefs and a confidence in his coaching and managerial ability. In 1982 he was then made manager of Rimini who were playing in Serie C. Here, he almost led them to the league title. The team's performances and results gave him the opportunity to move to Fiorentina as a youth coach. He was then appointed as manager of Parma, who at the time were competing in Italy's third division. He led Parma to promotion to Serie B in his first season, and in the following season, took them within three points of promotion to Serie A. In that second season, Sacchi's Parma beat AC Milan in the Coppa Italia. The team played with an intensity and style that caught the attention of AC Milan owner Silvio Berlusconi. In 1987, Arrigo Sacchi was appointed manager of AC Milan. The appointment, unsurprisingly, was met with a lot of scepticism by the media, who questioned Sacchi's track record and footballing pedigree. The press pointed out that Saki had a lack of high-level experience. 
and that he had never been a top player. This was familiar territory for Saki. His response was prepared, direct and quick. I never realised that in order to become a jockey, you have to have been a horse first. In the same press conference, Saki also bravely pointed out that the club were not in a position to really question his credentials. At the time, they were not one of the biggest clubs in the Italian top division. When Saki arrived at AC Milan, they had won just one Italian league title in 20 years. Their last trophy had been earned by winning a Serie B three years earlier following a previous relegation. Saki began revolutionising the Milan approach. They already had a formidable defence. Galli in goal, Tossati at right back, Varese and Costa Curta at centre back, with Paolo Maldini at left back. This was perhaps the best defensive lineup in history. However, they were also fantastic in attacking phases of play too. Franco Baresi and Paolo Maldini in particular, who both played for AC Milan their whole careers, could both be described as complete footballers. They were thoroughly competent in defensive aspects of the game, showing leadership, tactical intelligence and fantastic anticipation. But they were also equally effective in offensive situations. Saki's four-man midfield was made up of intelligent and hard-working players who were able to interchange positions with fluidity within a match. The midfield quartet displayed a range of different skill sets in both attacking and defensive aspects of the game. Carlo Ancelotti, who played in central midfield, was not a particularly combative or physical player, but showed good defensive anticipation to make important interceptions. In attacking situations, he had an excellent positional sense and passing range. Roberto Donadoni, a superb winger, could operate on either side of the pitch and would drift inside to combine an overload in central areas. Berlusconi supported Saki financially in the completion of AC Milan's 4-4-2 formation with the recruitment of three Dutch superstars, Frank Rijkaard, Ruud Hullet and Marco van Basten. Rijkaard was the complete box-to-box -box midfielder. He was extremely athletic, defending with pace and tackling with determination. He was also capable of getting forwards to support attacks and score vital goals. Rijkaard was a pivotal player for Saki's total football, connecting defence to attack. Hullet had previously played as a sweeper and in midfield, but Saki took advantage of Hullet's power and ability to dribble past the opposition, using him as a support striker and number 10, a link between midfield and attack. He was a player with physical presence who could break forward dangerously with the ball. Marco van Basten was the final piece in the jigsaw, an outstanding goalscorer. Van Basten was the highest striker and added world-class finishing to the forward line. The first 11 games of Saki's debut season were steady but not outstanding. Winning 5, drawing 4 and losing 2. However, in the remaining 19 games, Milan were undefeated, winning 12 and drawing 7. A mere 14 goals were conceded in the league that season. The next best total was nearly double that amount. Saki had led Milan to their first league title since 1979 and the club's 11th overall and he followed this up with the Italian Super Cup. All this success meant that AC Milan headed into the top European competition for the 1988-89 season. Some of Saki's greatest moments came in the top European competition. The early rounds of the 88-89 season saw success against Levski Sofia with a straightforward 7-2 aggregate victory. In the second round, Milan struggled and there was controversy. Alberto Donadoni suffered a bad foul and lay unconscious. His life was saved only through the quick thinking of the Red Star Belgrade physio, who broke his jaw to make a passage for oxygen to reach his lungs after he had suffered a bad foul and lay unconscious. The first leg ended 1-1, and the second leg was called off in the 64th minute and rescheduled to be replayed the next day due to the thick fog. Milan were losing 1-0 at that time. 
They eventually progressed following a penalty shootout. The quarter-final against Werder Bremen was a tight affair. Milan only went through 1-0 on aggregate thanks to a Van Basten penalty. In the semi-final they were drawn against Real Madrid with the first leg at the Bernabeu. They drew the game 1-1 with a goal from Van Basten. Back at the San Siro, Saki's team took Madrid apart in a stunning 5-0 victory. Saki perceives this game as the one in which all his life's work culminated. He considers this performance to be the best from any team that he had coached. In the final, AC Milan comfortably beat Stau Bucharest 4-0, with Hullet and Van Basten scoring two goals each in a comfortable win. Van Basten was the tournament's top scorer with 10 goals. The following season they added the European Super Cup and then the Intercontinental Cup, defeating Atletico Nacional of Colombia in Tokyo to become the club champions of the world. Although the team was not as strong as they had been in the previous season, they were victorious again in the European Cup for the 1989-90 season. They started with a comfortable 5-0 aggregate victory against HJK Helsinki. This meant they had to play Real Madrid for the second consecutive season. Again, they were victorious with a 2-1 aggregate victory with goals from Rijkaard and a Van Basten penalty in the first leg, enough to take them through. In the quarterfinals, they met Belgian side KV Mechinen, who they beat 2-0 in the second leg in the San Siro to progress into the semi-finals and meet German giants Bayern Munich. Milan drew 2-2 on aggregate but progressed on the away goals rule. In the final they played Sven Goran Eriksson's Benfica. Saki's tactical knowledge won the game for the Italians. He had noticed how they man-marked Van Basten and Saki asked Van Basten to drop into deeper spaces and pull the opposition defenders out of position. In fact, it was Van Basten who played the through ball to find Rijkaard's run from a deep position for the only goal of the game. By winning the final, Milan became the first team to retain the title since 1980, and the last team to do so until Real Madrid would manage the same feat 27 years later. Another European Super Cup was added to the collection, as was a second victory in the Intercontinental Cup, confirming their global status. The following season saw Milan finish second in the league behind Sampdoria, and they lost in the semi-finals of the Coppa Italia to the eventual champions Roma. They were eliminated from the European Cup following a floodlight failure in Marseille and a controversial UEFA decision to disqualify them after they refused to resume the game when power was restored. For two years, the club had dominated Italian, European and global football. The demands of Saki's intense approach took their toll. In 1991, Saki was offered the opportunity to take charge of the Italian national team. It was a deal that suited all parties. Saki left for the only job that could have tempted him away. The Italian manager's job required a more pragmatic Saki. As is often the case with international managers, Saki was frustrated by the limited contact time that he had with his players. It was impossible to create a squad dynamic that functioned like his well-drilled AC Milan team, simply because of the limited time on the training pitch. Saki and his coaching staff, which included former playmaker Carlo Ancelotti, meticulously prepared all training sessions and tactical scenarios. With great care, many players were tested in qualification games and friendlies. Saki based his Italian selection predominantly on Milan players, especially in the defensive line, which featured Paolo Maldini and Franco Beresi. This enabled his principles to be assimilated by the squad as quickly as possible. The attacking lineup was led by talismanic Roberto Baggio of Juventus. Notable exclusions from Saki's squad selections, however, included Gianluca Viali, Roberto Mancini, 
Giuseppe Bergami and Walter Zenga. This led to an argument that he favoured Milan. However, there was some common sense that was being applied. With such limited time with the squad, Saki selected players with whom he had previous experience and understood his methodologies and he could fully trust. Saki successfully led Italy through qualification with a battling campaign to reach the 1994 FIFA World Cup in the USA. He relied heavily on Baggio and also his own tactical management and brave squad selections. Ahead of the World Cup, Italy were not among the favourites and they started badly. They lost their first match 1-0 to the Republic of Ireland. Almost everything was being channeled through their playmaker Roberto Baggio, but the Irish defended well and caused Italy problems with their intensity and physicality and their direct style. In the second game, Italy beat Norway 1-0. This game was far from easy, with the goalkeeper Pagliuca sent off after 20 minutes for handball. To the astonishment of the Italian media, Sacchi substituted Roberto Baggio. Minutes into the second half, Franco Baresi was also injured and had to be substituted. However, in the 69th minute, Dino Baggio scored and the Italians hung on for victory. The result made a statement about Sacchi's bravery and management quality. In their final group game, Italy played Mexico and drew 1-1. They entered the second round as one of the best third-ranked teams and had to play the powerful Nigerians. Italy beat Nigeria in dramatic fashion. They went behind after 25 minutes and looked to be exiting the tournament until Roberto Baggio dramatically scored the equaliser after 88 minutes. The game went to extra time and Baggio scored again, the deciding goal from the penalty spot in the 102nd minute. In the quarter-final, Italy played Spain and again left it late, winning 2-1. Dino Baggio put the Italians ahead before Spain equalised. Roberto Baggio scored in the 88th minute again to win the game. The semi-final was against the surprise team of the tournament, Bulgaria. This was no easy task. This was Bulgaria's golden generation of players and included Christo Stoichkov. Italy won the game 2-1 with two more goals from Baggio. This earned Italy a place in the final against Brazil in Pasadena's Rose Bowl Stadium. It's the only World Cup final not to have had a goal scored. It was a sluggish game with very few chances. The Italians defended well, with the Brazilians unable to break through the centre-back pairing of Franco Baresi and Paolo Maldini. In extra time, the game livened up a bit, and there were a few attempts at goal but eventually the match was decided by a penalty shootout. Italian captain Baresi took the first penalty and blazed over the bar. The Brazilians also missed their first, but both teams scored thereafter. With Italy needing to score to keep their dreams alive, talisman Roberto Baggio stepped up to take the final penalty. He smashed his penalty over the bar in what would become an infamous moment in World Cup history. Overall, the Italians had huffed and puffed in the USA. However, actually reaching the final against Brazil underpinned Saki's status and proved that he was versatile. High temperatures had meant that his team was stretched to their limit in every match. He had adapted his high-pressing style and made Italy defensively more stable, a stark contrast to how he liked his Milan side to attack. Reaching the final was significant progress for the Italians, as they overcame almost a decade of underachievement coming within a penalty kick of international football's greatest prize. Under Saki, Italy qualified for Euro 96, but were eliminated from a group which included the eventual finalists, Germany and the Czech Republic. After this point, there was a steady decline in Saki's coaching career. He returned to manage Milan in December 1996. However, he wasn't as successful in his second period, finishing 11th in the league. In 1998, Saki took charge of Atletico Madrid in the Spanish La Liga for one season, but could only manage 13th place. He also briefly returned to Parma in 2001, replacing Alberto Malassani but resigned after disappointing results and poor health. Unable to continue coaching, 
He then took a position as director of football at Real Madrid for the 2004-2005 season. Some coaches achieve greatness through longevity. Saki's legacy came from a short burst of success that dramatically revolutionised the game. After his first management period at Milan, Saki had changed Italian football. When he started coaching, Catanaccio was the dominant style. Most sides played a back four, plus a libero, with tight man-to-man -man marking and a deep, dense defence. This system also used very few players in attacking situations. But Saki blended creative attacking football with strong, aggressive zonal defence from the front, an offside trap and playing a fluid 4-4-2 formation. Inspired by the legendary Dutch total football of the 1970s, Saki adopted and expanded the concept of a complete footballer and of a team who attack and defend as one. He was also a firm believer in team ethic and treating all players as equals. The midfielders were well-rounded and functional in every area. His forwards chased and his defenders pushed up. Milan was built around the effort to become a movement team, one which both attacked and defended with organisation, harmony and understanding. Saki was well known for implementing strict training regimes upon his players. He prepared tactical solutions and expected the players to memorise and implement these consistently during matches. Saki was also synonymous with shadow play. The Italian would have his players play matches in training with an imaginary football. He would tell the players where it was and the players would move accordingly. This rehearsal helped the players to make the best collective decisions when in and out of possession and allowed them to move as one unit when in a competitive game. Saki had three main innovations. Counter-pressing, zonal marking and compactness, and the offside trap. All three could be perceived as defensive innovations. However, Saki's interpretation of defending was more holistic. Defending was an aggressive, offensive-minded process that was designed to impact the attacking elements of the game. On losing possession, Saki's teams would immediately chase and press the opposition in possession to get the ball back as quickly as possible. Players around the ball would also close down passing lanes, confusing the opposition with the aim being to make interceptions or force errors to regain possession as quickly as possible. This style of pressing has been emulated successfully by many coaches including Mourinho, Guardiola and Klopp amongst many others. Saki was one of the pioneers in counter-pressing. These days it has evolved and teams are more consistent, fast and collective in their counter-press and will also apply it for an entire match. To press with intensity, Saki required his team to remain very compact making sure they did not have more than 25 metres in between the defensive line and the forwards. This also reduced the distance the players had to cover. Saki was one of the first managers to formally cut the field into zonal areas and asked his players to defend their zones in coordination. He reasoned that by squeezing the pitch in this way, the opponents would need to break down three lines of players in quick succession to get through his side. The defensive organisation with small gaps between the defensive midfield and attacking units meant that his teams played with a high defensive line. This required a good offside trap. The offside trap was already in use by some teams but in Saki's system it was fundamental. It was a way to defend but also a method to push his team to play forwards and on the front foot. Saki's high offside trap was revolutionary but carried great risk. It was the opposite of parking the bus. As a result, a lot of training exercises were centred around dealing with opposition attacks when outnumbered. 
Following on from these defensive strategies, Saki also meticulously rehearsed attacking movements to take advantage of transitions, turning defensive situations into attacking ones. The Milan team always looked to play forwards. Central defenders, most notably Baresi, were required to step into midfield to break into the middle third of the pitch. Previously, the central defenders were not required to do this in a four-man defence, a common feature these days but revolutionary at the time. Counter-attacking from the defensive third was rehearsed. Saki was one of the first coaches to use inverted wide players as an attacking tactical strategy. Players that started in a wide position, but who'd come inside to overload in central areas and create space in the channels for an overlapping fullback to exploit. This is very commonplace now, but Saki was one of the first coaches to employ the tactic regularly. In offensive situations, his Milan teams would also use third man runs. When overloading in central areas, his teams made quick one-touch passing combinations in order to create spaces to find a teammate breaking beyond the opposition defence with a run from a deeper position. It was exactly this movement that created the vital goal against Benfica when Milan won their second European final. Despite his relative inexperience as a player, Saki's coaching methods were exemplary and his ability to gain respect and focus from the high-profile players he coached was impressive. Saki was a visionary and went against his nation's footballing culture of the time and almost single-handedly revolutionised Italian football, creating one of the best club sides of all time. He not only entertained fans and left a legacy at Milan, but he showed bravery in his beliefs and a greatness in his coaching, something which very few have been able to achieve. Thank you for watching. Please take a moment to check out some other videos on Golden Game Soccer's YouTube channel, including some documentaries exploring the lives and careers of Rhinus Michels, Ernst Happel, and Dutch icon Johan Cruyff. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks again.